Okay, we start with a basic idea today. Scripture creates doctrine. And doctrine are the teachings of the faith. We don't make up these teachings as the church. We draw them from the Bible, both Old and New Testament. That's how we get our doctrines. That's how we get our teachings. We're not just making this up. And so let me give you two really quick examples, all right? Look at this first example of baptism. Here, or here what we see is God regularly uses means to bring people from death to life through the water. Now in this far right, really the first circle, you see Moses and God's people walking through the Red Sea. Now you probably remember this event, not because you were there, but because you probably saw the Prince of Egypt, right? DreamWorks, or how many old school Cecil B. DeMille's, anybody? Moses, yeah, all right. So you remember how that story goes. God's people were literally brought from death to life through the water. And it wasn't just the guys and it wasn't just the gals. It was for everybody, young and old and even infants. They all passed through that water and by means of Moses' leading, they were saved. Now, you take that story and you go to the New Testament and here you see in the center circle Jesus' baptism. Jesus himself is the means by which you are brought from death to life. And Jesus gives you that gift when he says, go and be baptized. He takes you and connects you to his life-saving death and resurrection through the waters of baptism. And that connects and bridges the Old and New Testament. And that's why we, you see the far right circle, that's why we baptize people here at church. Okay, you see how it works? Scripture creates doctrine, the teachings of the faith. Let's do one more. God gives a meal that connects people to his greatest act of saving. And this is what we see in the Bible first in the Passover, that far left-handed circle, all right? That's a picture of the Passover that happened in Exodus. And what God did is he gave his people Israel a very special meal that they were to eat and celebrate the life they had as God was judging the sin and the world out there outside. They were behind the blood-marked door from the lamb and they were eating for life. And outside was God's judgment for sin. Wow, all right, pretty big story. And then you move into the New Testament, that center circle, and Jesus himself takes the Passover and he pours new life and new meaning into it. It's not just a, a remembering meal. It's not just a ritual. No, Jesus himself is the lamb whose blood covers us. And when we eat and drink of the Lord's Supper, we are connected to the very life-saving work of Jesus, what he did on the cross for you, which is why we have communion here at church. That's the far right-hand bubble. You see how that works? Okay, so that's the idea. Scripture creates doctrine, the teachings of the faith. As we continue our paradox series today, we will be looking at the paradox of law and gospel. Now, this isn't something that we made up. No, this is the, the teaching of the whole Bible. Law and gospel are two teachings in the Bible that seem contradictory, and yet they are both true. Here's what the law says. The law says, do, all right? And the gospel says, done. You might be thinking to yourself, which is it, do or done? And the answer is, both. <laughs> Isn't that kind of fun? All right, let's take a look at the definition of the law. Let's move the slide along. The law is what we are to do and not to do. How many of you know the Bible has a bunch of that going on, right? This is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're not supposed to do. Now, this is important. The law isn't what saves us, though. Our obedience to the law in the Bible is not what saves us. Instead, that's what the gospel does. Look at this definition of the gospel. The gospel is what God has done and still does in Jesus for you. Now, that's important because the gospel is not what you did to become a Christian. 
No, this is talking about what God did for you. And that's a huge difference. The way I usually, okay, that's good. Let's move to the next slide. The way I usually like to sum this all up is I like to say the difference between the law and the gospel is the difference between who's doing the verbs, all right? This is what I mean, ready? If we have to do something, if we're in charge of the verbs, that is the law, all right? But if God is doing the verbs, if God is doing it, then it's gospel, You see how that works? All right, let's see if you all got it so far. Let's take an example. Like, for instance, if I were to say to you, you should be faithful to God, is that law or gospel? Good, you guys are doing good. A little more over on this side of the room than this side of the room. That's kind of interesting. You get a chance to bounce back, don't worry. Now watch how I can take that phrase, you should be faithful to God. Watch how I turn it into a gospel statement. God has been faithful to you in Jesus. Do you see how that, that statement is either law or gospel depending on who's doing the action? You see how that works? That's usually a pretty good way to figure out in the Bible um, whether you're in a law statement or a gospel statement. Law and gospel is the key to reading the Bible. But if you haven't noticed, the Bible is a really big book. Amen? Amen? little confusing at times. Amen? Anybody confused by the Bible sometimes? Just a couple of us. The rest of you are all scholars. Very impressive. Okay? And you're reading the Bible and you made a pledge. Like, I'm going to read the Bible this year. And as you're reading along, you'll run into something where you'll be like, oh, that is not going to fly in the world, right? People will disagree. That's going to offend a lot of people. How many know there's offensive stuff in the Bible? And sometimes when you're reading the Bible, sometimes it even offends you, right? Because you're like, I don't know if I agree with that. Listen, if you are reading the Bible and you have not been offended, you are not yet reading the Bible correctly, all right? But at the same time, if you're reading the Bible and you have not yet been comforted, you're still not reading the Bible the way that it wants to be read. Because there is great comfort in the gospel and scriptures. Sometimes you will read something about Jesus and it will comfort you so much. And when you see that, and in that moment, you are experiencing the gospel because of something that God did for you in Christ. And that's really why I like our reading for today from John chapter 8. It is the perfect example of law and gospel in the scriptures. How many of you secretly really like this story in the Bible? Nobody? Just, just a couple. Oscar and I. I like that about you, Oscar. All right? I love this story because it is a perfect illustration of this paradox of law and gospel. Here, you have a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. I'm not going to get into how they found out about that. I'm just saying that it was a fact. And according to the Old Testament law, that was an executable offense. And that's, that's intense. Here we see the law. But then Jesus turns to her and says a word over her that changes and transforms her life. He publicly forgives her to where she's no longer guilty of that crime. It's a powerful story. Now what I think is fun is that Jesus does something right in the middle of that event that is kind of weird. He actually does it twice. How many of you thought it was weird that as they bring this charge against this woman, Jesus just bends down and starts drawing in the dirt? Did you notice that? How many of you are like, I want to know what he wrote? Anybody? Yeah, I want to know what he wrote too. You know, and I've got to be perfectly honest, I don't know what he wrote. I know that's disappointing, right? Because we all kind of want to know what he was writing there. Do you know the earliest church guesses back in the earliest centuries of the church, they had guessed that Jesus had written down the sins of all of them? Right? Kind of leveling the play field. And whereas that's a really cool idea, we actually don't know (laughs) what he wrote. What I think one thing he was doing is Jesus was drawing a line in the sand between law and gospel. You know, I think 
Sometimes when we're in this story in John chapter 8, we always think that the harshness of her sentence is really, really too far. And we feel like Jesus is agreeing with us that, it's, that punishment is unreasonable when he does what he does. But if we were more serious about moral failure, perhaps our world, perhaps our society would not be as lost and confused as it is today. Think for a second that Jesus, that God was deadly serious in the law. And if you take that seriously today, then perhaps we could see how serious forgiveness is. She should have died, but God takes forgiveness and life transformation so seriously that he would die in her place and our place as well. Perhaps if we took forgiveness, perhaps if we took the gospel more seriously, then we would have no choice than to walk away forever changed by the grace of Jesus Christ in those moments of our lives as well. When he was the one pulling us up from the dirt, when the law had us dead to rights. Literally, the best part of John chapter 8 is when Jesus puts his hand into the very same dirt that he formed humanity from and he pulls out a new life for the woman caught in sin. He makes a new person when he pulls her up from the dirt. And that's powerful. This story talks about the seriousness of the law, which is true, but it also shows us that we are all forgiven at the feet of Jesus. This is the consistent teaching of the Bible. Let's look at a couple of verses. All right, check out this one from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All of our sins are forgiven by God. But it's not just all of our sins. The sins of the whole world are forgiven. Look at this from Mark chapter 3, verse 28. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of men. Everyone's sins have been fully and freely forgiven by Jesus. But now look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Actually, let's read this together. Put on then as God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Yikes, right? Rut row. Look at the end of that verse. You must also forgive. How many of you, that makes you just a little uncomfortable? Yeah, now we've transitioned from the gospel back into the law, right? But both are true, both law and gospel, and that's the paradox, that's the tension that we live in. You know, this week we just picked up our daughter from um, camp. She went for her very first time. She survived, it's great news. And this is actually the camp that my wife and I worked at for a very long time. It's actually where we met. Actually, the two greatest things I have in my life I got from camp. I found Jesus there, or rather, he found me. I guess that's the right way to say it, right? And I found my future wife there. And I'd like to share with you a story of when we were just about to date. We were like minutes before dating. Is that okay? I have her permission, so this is all good. It's been cleared with the boss, all right? Um, we used to have this thing at camp that we would do um, every weekend after a worship service. Um, we would have a worship service at camp and it would be led by a local congregation. And uh, you might think that that was my favorite thing, but actually my favorite thing was just after the worship service. I know I'm very ashamed to admit that my favorite thing happened after church, but guess what it was? It was a sandwich bar. <laughs> yeah, my whole life if it were just a sandwich, right? And so after church, what we would do is we'd go down into the kitchen and they had this, this long, you know, median section and they would have all the fixins laid out and man, I was in heaven. 
But I remember this one Sunday, this was just before we started dating, um, they, we were leaving from the chapel where we had just had church, and it was very clear that the staff had divided into two groups equally. And I thought this was very strange, because I only had sandwiches on the brain, right? And one group was aware of something that one of the worship leaders, some issue, some personal thing that they had in their life, and they were, they were aware of it, and it was sin. And they were really, really angry. And then the other group was really, really angry at that group for being angry at that person. And I thought to myself, how do you guys know what's going on in people's personal lives? That was very strange. I was like, let's just go have a sandwich, right? All right, but here's what happened. We got into the kitchen in that long counter, right? And one group lined up on one side of the counter and the other group lined up on the other side of the counter. And I was the program director, so I was at the head because I always make two sandwiches. Amen for two sandwiches? And so this group on this side, they started launching into a very serious critique of this person's life. How dare that person be there at our worship service? What kind of person would lead our worship service who has this kind of sin in their life? Don't they know that that is wrong? And as I was listening to them, I was like, well, you know, the Bible, I thought of like five verses that supported their argument, but I was feeling really uncomfortable. So I was like, pass me the lettuce. <laughs> then the other group, which was led by this gorgeous gal, that's my wife. <laughs> and she was launching back at that whole group saying, how dare you guys? I can't believe that you would behave this way, that you would judge another person like that. You're exactly like the Pharisees in the Old Testament. And she had a lot of really good points that she was saying, right? And I was like, yeah, well, that's true as well. But then the most dangerous thing happened. She looks at me and she says, well, what do you think? <laughs> now remember, I want to date this gal, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, Ugh. I pause and I look up at her and I say, well, Melissa, what do you want me to judge him according to? Do you want me to judge him according to the law? Because yes, according to the law, if that's something in his life, it is sin. And it is condemnable by scripture, that's absolutely correct. If you want me to judge him according to the law, yes, they're right. But if you're gonna judge him according to the law, then we all have to sit under the law. And we all have to have our sins judged by the law. And I said, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel really uncomfortable. I don't want to stand before God with nothing but me and the law between them. And so if we're going to condemn him, we all stand condemned as well. I said, but do you want me to judge him according to the gospel? Because according to the gospel, this person is a person for whom Christ died and rose again so that they might have full and free forgiveness as well. According to the gospel, they are fully and freely forgiven of all of their sins and their slate is wiped clean. And I don't know about you, but I would rather be judged according to the gospel. Amen? I said, so I'd love to stand before God with Jesus at my side. So what do you want me to judge them according to, the law or according to the gospel? I said, as for me, I think I'd want to be judged according to the gospel. And she said, good answer. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I took my two sandwiches and ran to the next room. <laughs> this paradox between law and gospel is the very truth that's highlighted for us today in scripture. And living in the paradox between law and gospel is knowing that the law is correct and yet our attitude towards others matches the gospel. Do you see that? Now people say that the gospel is grace as a free gift, and that is true, amen? It's true, that's the truth of the gospel, the grace is a free gift, but there's a way in which people can misunderstand that. You see, grace is a free gift, that is true, but when I think of a gift, I think of a thing. How many of you are with me? When I think of a gift, I think of a box or a bag. I think of a thing. 
And grace is not a thing. It is something that exists in God. Grace is not a substance you can have. It is something that exists in the very heart of God. It is God's attitude towards sinners. That's grace as a gift. His free attitude towards you is a gift, not a substance. The gospel is a person, and that person is Jesus. And perhaps that's how we can think about this paradox. The substance of the law drives disconnection, but the gospel is about a person, Jesus, how to treat them. The gospel is about the person and work of Jesus. A great theologian once said, Christ for us always precedes Christ in us. Did you catch that? Christ for us always precedes Christ in us. And the clearest place in the whole Bible where the paradox of law and gospel meet is at the cross of Jesus. There is the law. There is the gospel. There is one person, Christ for us, in his name. Amen.